no problem. But if he has more than one woman, he will be the bad man. Like in America, one man has got four mistress, five mistress, ten mistress, even in India, he's a bad man. But if he has a legal wife, if he does nikah, if he marries her, gives her due rights, gives her mayor, equal time, equal justice, then he's a good man. But now the counter question, why can't a woman have more than one husband, correct? Is that your question? Uh, Is your question that why can't no, a woman I, have more I than one husband? I'm thinking that in case if female population increases and male population decreases, so female can have two or three husbands. That's a very good question. You have a hypothetical question. But Almighty God, who's our creator, he knows better than you and me. He's our creator. And the reason, because God has made the woman a stronger sex. She is medically more stronger than the man. You know that? I'm a medical doctor, sister. Medically, a woman can live for longer years than a man. We think the man is strong. Physically, man is strong. But medically, the woman is stronger. She lives longer, her longevity. The average span of a woman is few years more than a man. There are less deaths in the pediatric age group. And regarding your main question, that Islam allows polygyny, a man to have more than one wife, but does not allow polyandry, that is a woman to have more than one husband. Why? The reason is that if a man has more than one wife, and if a child is born, you can easily identify who is the father and who is the mother. But if a woman has more than one husband, and if the child is born, you can identify the mother, but you can't identify the father. <laughs> so if you go to admit your child in the school, what is the name of the father? You may have to give two names. <laughs> now we know that medical science is advanced by DNA, genetic coding. We can come to know who the father is, but that is now, not in the past. Islam is there since time immemorial. And this is not the only reason. Furthermore, there are various other reasons. Man is biologically more sexual as compared to the woman. Thirdly, a man can do the role of a multiple husband as compared to women doing a role of multiple wives. Because she undergoes menstrual cycle, there are various psychological changes, which it will be difficult for her to do the role of multiple wives. And furthermore, today science tells us that if a man has more than one sexual partner, and if they're loyal to them, like if a man has more than one wife, more than one sexual partner, and if all of them are faithful to each other, the man does not, neither the woman develop any sexual transmit disease. But if a woman has more than one sexual partner, if she has more than one husband, then the sexually transmitted disease will emerge. She will have that disease and she will retransmit it back to the husband. So even medically, it is not good for a woman to have more than one sexual partner. Hope that answers the question. Uh, my name is Beryl D'Souza. I'm from Bombay. Uh, tonight, I must thank you for the wonderful lecture. And I must tell you that uh, I used to see you on the television and follow your lectures ever since. Yeah, since the past some years when I was in college. I, tonight I would like to ask you a question. Uh, first of all, I would like to tell you two things. You said two things. One was like, associating anything with God is a sin. It's the biggest sin, rather. The second thing you said that the form of prayer is that the Muslims follow, is that you put your forehead down and it humbles yourself. Now, myself being from Bombay, I would, uh, uh, because this is something I've noticed there, I, and I would also like to know clearly what is the concept about the dargahs that people go to and the uh, people follow. The sister asked a very good question. She asked me a question regarding the Muslims now. And it's a very intelligent question. She says that in Islam, if associating partners with God is the biggest sin, and the best form of worship is to prostrate, then what happens in dargahs? People go to dargah and they prostrate. So is it right or is it wrong is the basic question. Sister, I do agree with you. You have understood my lecture very clearly and very correctly, that associating partners with God. Anyone does, it is wrong. Whether he calls himself a Muslim or non-Muslim. Whether he calls himself John, Abdullah, Zakir, Muhammad, Anyone who associates partners with God, he is doing the biggest sin. And we can prostrate to no one but to Almighty God. So anyone who prostrates to anyone besides Almighty God, he is doing shirk. 
he's asserting partners with God. So if any human being goes to any grave and he prostrates to that grave and he worships that grave, he's doing the biggest sin, irrespective whether he calls himself a Muslim or non-Muslim. Does the sister have a connected question? So, um, okay, if you would give me the opportunity, I would further like to ask you. So, um, basically, I've seen, like you said, anybody, okay, be it a Muslim or Christian or Hindu, whoever does that. Now, if I tell you, I, uh, from what I have seen and known, is like a huge percentage, okay, they are the, uh, the people, uh, I could call them the Muslims. They go to the Targas, then what would you have to say about it? Okay, as far as the Arabic word Muslim is concerned, a true Muslim is a person who submits his will to God. A true Muslim will never bow down to any grave. I am aware, sister. I wouldn't say that you are wrong, you are right, that there is quite a large quantity of so-called Muslims who bow down to these graves. What do I have to say? I feel they are doing wrong, they are doing shirk, they have to change. And that's what in my talks I even tell them that if you want to go to a grave, the Prophet said that you can go to a grave, it reminds you of your akhira, that one day you have to die. So when you go to a grave, you can pray for the person, but you can't pray to him. You can pray for him, that may Allah give him janat firdaus may he forgive his sins, etc. But you can't pray to him. Prayers should only be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Iyaka nabdu wa iyaka nastain. They alone we worship, they alone we ask for help. So my talks are even targeted to these Muslims, and I tell them also that I have given other talks, that you should not worship, you should not prostrate to graves. This is wrong, it's a big sin. And Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah, since you are from Bombay, I am also from Bombay, there are thousands of youngsters, mashallah, after my talk, who have stopped worshipping graves. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Hope that answers the question. Yes. My question is that earlier you mentioned that Jesus is also a Muslim because he submits to the will of God. Um, and this is regardless of the fact that he drank alcohol, he didn't pray five times a day. You know, he, he, all he, the only action he did was submit to the will of God. So, given that, that thinking, that logic, wouldn't that mean that any person of the book, Christian or Jew, is in fact a Muslim, as long as they agree to mit, submit to the will of God? Whether well, if I understood your question correctly, you said any person, whether Christian or Jew, etc., who submits the will to God is a Muslim. Yeah, as you said about, about Jesus, you said Jesus is a Muslim right. for that reason. But whether, I do agree with you, anyone who submits the will to God in Arabic, you call him a Muslim, but you should first know what has God commanded us. If you think something else, if you read a scripture which is not the word of God and start thinking or submitting a will to God by following a scripture which is not the word of God, then you are not a true Muslim. So first you have to identify what has God commanded us. And if you do a comparative study of all the scriptures of the various world religions, you will find out if you use the test of science, logic, etc., the only scripture that passes the test is the last and final testament. If there's something like Old Testament and New Testament, the Quran is the last testament. So, if you want to truly submit a will to God, first you have to find out who is this true God, what has He commanded us, and after that you have to submit your will. So therefore, when I say a true Muslim is a person who follows the commandments of Almighty God. Now Jesus Christ, peace be upon Him, was a messenger of God. He directly got revelation from God. So surely he followed the will of Almighty God. So today also, if a Christian, supposedly, what the talk is based on, that at least let us agree to follow what is common in your scripture and my scripture. Suppose you will say Bible is the word of God, I am saying Quran is the word of God. So let us agree to follow what is common, what is different, keep it aside. So your Bible says believe in one God. So if you believe in Trinity, you are going against the Bible. The word Trinity does not exist in the Bible. But it's then the Quran. Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, 171, Wala taqulu salasa, don't say trinity. So if you believe in trinity, you're going against the Bible. But the Bible says that, that you should not do idol worship. Bible says you have to believe in the last and final messenger. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14, I have many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now, for he when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself. All that the year shall he speak. He shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me. So if you are a true follower of the Bible, you have to follow in the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. That means you have to follow the Quran. 
and the sayings of the Prophet. So if you follow the Quran and the sayings of the Prophet, you become a Muslim. So my talk is based on, let us agree to follow what is common. Differences, as I told earlier, I can give a talk on hundreds of contradictions in the Bible, which I don't intend doing. There was a person who wrote a book in USA, Dr. William Campbell, that there are 30 scientific errors in the Quran. I went to Chicago and had a debate, and I clarified all his misconception. And when I pointed out 38 scientific errors in the Bible, he could not reply to any. So I cannot attribute these errors to Almighty God. So first I have to identify which is the book of God, and then follow it. So even if you agree for sake of argument that Bible is the word of God, even then you have to follow the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So let us agree what is common in both the scriptures and let us agree at least implement on that today and come to common terms. Hope that answers the question. is a shoreless ocean whose pearls decorate every aspect of our lives if we would just reflect the Prince of Piety is a Quranic series for exactly that more lessons than you ever imagined from a story you thought you knew in the name of Allah, Lord of all the world. Get ready to grab the divine messages essential to make our lives perfectly prosperous in the Prince of Piety today at 7 p.m. and repeat telecast at 6.30 a.m. Saudi Arabia on Peace TV. discovery through our Islamic path to find lessons for our Islamic future. Perceive the unusual and consistent progress of Islam due to its unique attitude with the passage of time in Lessons from Islamic History, next on Peace TV. Yes, brother. Good evening, uh, doctor. My name is Daniel. I'm a student. Uh, the 54th verse of the seventh chapter of the Quran says that Allah created the earth, the heavens and the earth, in six days. And the 42nd chapter, verses 9 to 12, clearly state that Allah created earth and heaven as it is today in eight days. What is your reply to that? The brother asked a question asked by Christian missionaries against the Quran. And there are several places in the Quran where it says Allah has created the heavens and the earth in six days. What the brother is referring, chapter number 41, verse number 9 to 12. He is saying that the Quran says that the heavens and the earth was created in eight days. The word eight is not there in the Quran. What it says, I'll tell you. The Quran says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has created the heavens and the earth. And all those who differ, there are people who are bound to differ, are the ones who do shirk. 
and the verse continues almighty god created the earth in two days and almighty god created the sustenance on the earth the mountains everything else in four days and verse number 11 of chapter number 41 summa most of the translations say after it means various other things then almighty god created the heavens in two days now normally a person reads two plus four plus two is equal to eight but the word eight is not there god almighty created the heavens in two days now if we know quran we'll be able to reply if a person does superficial reading he may get misled and quran says those people who try to mislead the people with this verse are those who associate partners with god so almighty god knows that people will use these verses of the quran to mislead the people the reply to the query the reply is that almighty god created the earth in two days they created the sustenance the trees the mountains and in due proportion in four days summa summa in arabic can also mean simultaneously it doesn't have to mean after it can mean that it can mean simultaneously almighty god created the heavens in two days for example if i tell you i am going to construct a building 30 stories high in six months that's my statement if you go into details i tell that i will be creating the basement the foundation of the building in two months and the structure in four months all the 30 stories simultaneously when i'm creating the foundation i will even create the compound wall in two months so basically while i'm creating the foundation i'm even creating the compound wall that doesn't mean it is two plus four plus two eight months it is while i'm creating the foundation simultaneously i'm even creating the compound wall so actually my building will be constructed in six months not eight months so similarly when allah says when he created the earth he even created the heavens so the two days of the earth simultaneously allah creates the heaven that is the reason allah says in the quran in surah ambiya chapter number 21 verse number 30 avalam yara allazina kafaru do not the unbelievers see anna samawati wal arda kanat ratkan fataknahuma that the heaven and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder so quran says we created the heaven and the earth simultaneously fa fataknahuma we clove them asunder this is nothing but the big bang in a nutshell today big bang tells us that the whole universe was one primary nebula later on there was secondary separation which gave rise to galaxies the stars the planets the earth on which we live so based on big bang science even doesn't disagree with the quran that when the heaven was being created the earth was being created simultaneously so the first two days and the last two days are simultaneously so there's no contradiction it's a contra distinction contra distinction means giving other facets of the thing it is not contradiction contradiction means two things with the opposite contra distinction means telling you other qualities for example if i say that you are very honest tomorrow i tell you are very kind it's not contradiction it's a contra distinction you're honest also and you're kind also but tomorrow if i say they're dishonest then there's a contradiction so this verse of the quran gives more details how the six days were divided first two days the earth simultaneously the heavens and later on four days the things on the earth were made the mountains the trees in due proportion hope that answers the question me mumbai zai i have been attending your uh, talks in dubai and other places for the last 6 years today it was a scintillating and fantastic talk by you i have been uh, reading islam in focus in college times and i uh, have read the holy quran in saudi arabia could you please el elucidate on uh, what is taqwa and about surah al fatiha brother mashallah brother mahesh is from bombay the same town where i come from he has been hearing my lectures for the past 6 years and the other sister also mashallah she has been hearing my talks for a few years and he asked the question that what is taqwa taqwa means piety it means god consciousness it means righteousness there's a hadith someone asked what is taqwa it is like when you're going in a forest which has got thorns etc and you're afraid that your garment may get stuck in the thorns 
so how carefully you pick up your garment and walk through these plants and trees of thorn that is taqwa so basically it is god consciousness it is piety it is righteousness so this is what is taqwa in short and i would like to invite you that since you have been watching and hearing my talks since the past 6 years and the other sisters past few years we live in the same city bombay i would like to welcome you to the fold of the dinul haq the religion of truth and i pray to allah subhanahu wa taala to give you hidayah and inshallah inshallah <laughs> and inshallah i pray to allah to give you hidayah and inshallah you also have the true taqwa that's the god consciousness and piety hope that answers the question brother swen bensler you mentioned a lot of references of the bible what about john 1030 the father and me are one the brother quote the verse of the bible gospel of john chapter number 10 verse number 30 the father and me are one it is not the father and me are one it is i and my father are one it's not the father and me are one now this quotation i and my father are one to know what it is you have to know the context you have to understand the context that i and my father are one to know this you have to go a few verses earlier if you read gospel of john chapter number 10 verse number 23 it speaks about the context that the jews they entered the temple in solomon's porch verse number 23 verse number 24 says that the jews came upon jesus christ peace be upon him and they asked him how long does thou make us doubt if thou art the christ tell us plainly verse number 25 says i have told you but you believe not in me the work that i do they bear witness of my father verse number 26 says you do not believe in me because you are not my sheep verse number 27 says my sheep they hear me and they follow me verse number 28 i give them eternal life no man can pluck them out of my hand verse number 29 says my father that give it to me is greater than all no man can pluck them out of my father's hand i and my father are one so in context it means in purpose verse number 28 says that no man can pluck them out of my hand verse number 29 says my father is greater than all no man can pluck them out of my father's hand verse number 30 i and my father are one so it means they are one in purpose if i say my father is a medical doctor and he is a doctor i am a medical doctor and my father are one it means we are one in profession it does not be one in person but the christian say no no it means one in person and my father are one indicates that jesus christ peace be upon his god if i agree for sake of argument further if you read in the gospel of john chapter number 17 verse number 21 jesus christ peace be upon him says my father is in me and i in thee he tells the apostles to his 12 apostles my father is in me i and thee and we are one the same one is used here so do you mean to say there are 14 gods now father is in jesus christ jesus christ peace be upon him is in the apostles so there will be 14 gods so we have to coin a new word instead of trinity we have to coin a word for 14 gods here what jesus christ peace be upon him meant the same one was used that one in purpose and further it's mentioned in the gospel of john chapter number 17 verse number 23 that jesus christ peace be upon him it is the apostles that i am in you and you and me we are one that means one in purpose and immediately you read further gospel of john chapter 10 verse number 31 the jews they pick up stones to stone jesus christ peace be upon him verse number 32 jesus christ peace be upon him says many of good works have i done for which of my good works do you stone me verse number 33 see all this is from my head any christian who has a bible can open and check up all the references i'm giving gospel of john chapter number 10 verse number 33 says that we don't stone you for good works you being a man you blaspheme me saying i am god verse number 34 says that isn't it mentioned in your scriptures that ye are gods and the one to whom the word of god comes is called as god your scripture is not broken so here if you read in context that i and my father are one is in purpose it doesn't mean that they are one in unity and it doesn't claim at all that jesus christ peace be upon him is god otherwise it would mean that there are 14 gods so what it means is that the purpose of almighty god and jesus christ the messenger of god is one and the same hope that answers the question